Uh, I'm Alberto Sandoval, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Community and Government Relations at UC Irvine, a uh, small little school over the hill uh, that we are happy to partner with the Newport Chamber. Uh, we've got a great speaker, wonderful speaker actually, and before we do that, we're going to hear from Steve Rosansky. Thank you, Alberto. Good morning. Yeah, okay, thank you. I was waiting for my round of applause. But some you guys just need to dry out or you got water on the brain or something. So uh, welcome. I'm Steve Rosansky, President and CEO of the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce. And this is our um, second uh, Wake Up Newport of the Year. we got a great speaker, uh, as Alberto alluded to just a minute ago. I do want to introduce a few people that are with us this morning. So first off, uh, City Councilwoman Robin Grant's with us. I see uh, Nancy Scarborough with the Finance Committee and also a candidate for City Council, an announced candidate for City Council. Uh, Pierre Swan with the Irvine Ranch Water District, he's a director there. Uh, I saw Paul Watkins in the back, he's on the Board of Library Trustees, the President, and he had a big victory uh, in January, getting the uh, Library Lecture Hall uh, approved by the City Council. So in about two years, yeah, we're having the groundbreaking out here in February, and uh, about two years we'll hopefully be having our meetings in the new library lecture hall that is going to be outside the entrance to the bamboo courtyard. So, how big is it going to be? Uh, it'll seat 300, so fairly large sized building. It'll look similar to the rest of the city hall and library complex. Uh, my counterpart over at the Costa Mesa Chamber of Commerce, uh, Dave uh, Haithcock, he's uh, the president and CEO over there at Costa Mesa, and he came to visit. My sister's pointing at somebody, oh, and yeah, at Howard Herzog in the back, he's with the Civil Service Board. So I, usually I write all this stuff down, but I couldn't find a piece of paper. So um, if I didn't notice or uh, recognize you, please. oh, and of course, our biggest group here is back. I want to introduce Amy Burke. She's the director of the DECA Club over at Harbor High School. If it wasn't for them, the room would be a little emptier, or a lot emptier, so thank you for filling a third of our seats. We appreciate that. You're, all, you're always welcome here at this meeting and any of our other meetings that we do, and we do a lot of them. So uh, happy to have you guys come out and see, see what business people do, and uh, excited. Uh, I, I think there's some big national championship for DECA here in Anaheim this year, right? Yeah. So we're looking forward to that, too. Maybe I'll sign up and be a judge or something, and, although I don't know if it's cool to judge your team, but from Newport Beach. Anyway, thank you all for coming, braving the weather, and I'm going to turn it back over to Alberto, and he's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you. All right. So, Jeff Ball is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Orange County Business Council, where he represents interests of local businesses and organizations together with academia, UCI, uh, and government to promote the economic growth of the nation's sixth largest county, Orange County, California. Ball is the founder of Friendly Hills Bank in Whittier, where he previously served as president and chief executive officer, and is currently vice chair. His more than 25 years of experience in commercial and investment banking includes leadership positions with the Bank of America, as well as past chair of the California Bankers Association. Currently, he serves on the boards of directors for the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, Mobility 21, Data Center Inc., and the Kinetic Academy Charter School. He is also a member by appointment of the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission of the California State Bar and the Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges. Prior to earning his MBA from Whittier College, Ball earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from University of Puget Sound. An advocate of financial literacy, Ball frequently guest lectures on topics of financial and economic principles at high schools and universities across the nation. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Ball. Good morning. Good morning. Wake up. <laughs> Alberto, you did it almost the way I asked you to do it. Thank you. But uh, yes, my name is Jeff Ball, and I am honored to be the president and CEO of the Orange County Business Council. Starting my third year, many of you knew Lucy Dunn. I've had several people come up to me and say, oh, you're the new Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. But uh, a couple of things I wanted to start off with this morning. First of all, Steve, beautiful Chamber of Commerce Day. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Yeah, <laughs> right? But I wanted to do two things this morning. Number one, I wanted to talk a little bit about the business council because often there's that I get uncertainty in terms of, well, exactly what is there? Are you the chamber? Are you the advocacy shop? So I want to talk a little bit about what we are and what we're focused on. And it provides a good level set for some statistics that I'm going to give you about Orange County. And then at the end, be happy to take whatever questions that you might have. So thank you for being here. So first of all, let me start off with what is the Orange County Business Council? As Alberto said, we represent the interests of the business community, but we do it working with government and with academia. Our standpoint is to get the most important people in Orange County to the table together to understand the facts, to approach the issues, take advantage of the opportunities, all with the intention of having economic growth and prosperity for Orange County. And we want to achieve that while preserving this high quality of life that we're all blessed to have here in Orange County. In fact, my hope is that as we grow, we can improve it. So that is the focus of OCBC. Everything we do, everything you hear me say, every position I take in DC, Sacramento, or the building next door is all based on economic growth and prosperity while maintaining and preserving this high quality of life. It's something we can all get behind. And because of that, it's allowed us to bring a lot of different interesting parties to the table to talk about a lot of the key issues that are impacting Orange County. The foundational basis that we work from is the fact that we have to grow our economy in order to preserve and enhance this quality of life that we enjoy. There are certain people that would just as soon see the population shrink. If the population shrinks, we don't need as many roads, we don't need as much infrastructure. But I think we all know, I would hope, since I'm speaking to a chamber group, that that's really not it. We, we really have to be able to move forward, and that is going to be driven primarily by the private sector. But the private sector and the public sector have to work together. And that's a big part of what we strive to do at the Orange County, uh, Orange County Business Council. We used to be the Orange County Chamber of Commerce, by the way, years ago. Uh, I'm not going to take time to go into all that history, but we're a culmination of several county-wide groups that all came together around this premise. Uh, everything centers around economic development. So when you see us advocating, when you see us informing the community, when you see us trying to provide connections and promoting things, it's all driven around economic development. All right? So how do we do that? Economic development is the center. It is the keystone of everything that we do, as I described. We have identified three <coughs> critical areas of risk that are going to impact our ability to achieve our objectives in economic development. One of those is workforce. That's why I'm so happy to see these guys over here. Right? They are our future workforce. We need workforce if we're going to grow the economy. Many of our businesses are already struggling with finding the right employees with the right talent that are willing to work to fulfill what they need to do as a business, organizations included. By the way, labor market is an open pool. Any of us can work public or private. So when we implement rules on the private sector and assume that the public sector can be excluded, it doesn't work that way. Because we all have the ability to choose for ourselves where we want to work. If UCI decides, okay, everybody that works at UCI is going to make $50 an hour, but we're not going to apply it to anybody else, you really think that's not going to have an effect on the flower shop in Baton Island? No, because if they want to hire the best people, they've got to come up to it also. So workforce is essential. And when we think about workforce, we think about workforce not just in terms of developing our workforce, but also retaining our workforce. When's the last time we had a law passed in California that made it easier and more simple to employ people? I don't know. I'm not as old as you, Peter, but I don't remember. Maybe back in your time. But 
we continue to make it harder. So part of what we do is work with our partners in education, with the business community, to help develop our workforce, but to also help our employers be able to manage that workforce so that it could be more effective and be able to retain it. The other critical issue we would say, which I would represent to you as our number one crisis in Orange County today, I could spend two hours on this, but if I do, Hancock will have me come repeat it, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Housing is our number one crisis. We do not have enough homes. Where are these kids going to live when they come out of high school, college, get into the workforce? Do we want them to stay in Orange County? I do. Those are good looking kids. I bet they're pretty smart. We want them here in our workforce, but where the hell are they going to live? I have two older kids, past college, as I like to say, off the payroll, but they're also off the state. They moved out of state because that's where they felt they could find the best opportunity, and I couldn't blame them. Housing is a big issue, and if we're going to continue to grow our economy, which means we're going to need to continue to have a certain type of workforce, and by the way, we need workforce in all segments. Some are focused on the very high, some are focused on the very low. I tend to focus in the middle. But we need all of them to be able to grow our economy, and they've got to have a place to live. It all comes to supply. And we have state laws. And I love the ocean, and I love the parks, and I love clean air as much as any of But I also want our people to have a place to live. And I could go on and on in terms of the homeless crisis, and you're all aware of the fact we need housing, and we need housing throughout the state, but particularly in Orange County. I'm going to show you some data in a little bit that will amplify that issue. The other thing that we've identified is infrastructure. We have got that. We're going to continue to grow the economy. We have to have an adequate infrastructure. We have a state mandate that says we have to be all electric by some date. Okay. That's a goal, that's not a mandate. And how nice that they provided a clear path for us to get to where we are today <laughs> to where we got to go. And that's the challenge that we face. And guess what? The new chair of the Energy Committee and the Assembly is our own Cotty. So we're working with Cotty very closely on a lot of the issues related to energy. But infrastructure also means water, wastewater, broadband, anything that we need to support our business. If we can't continue to increase, we are not going to conserve our way into prosperity. We have to continue to find ways to develop and build our infrastructure. I could go on and on. But Orange County, we are very fortunate. We have leadership that has come generations before us that has made the types of investments that allow us to maximize what we have. And as a region, be less dependent on outside sources than other parts of Southern California. So when you see someone from Irvine Ranch, tell them I said so. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure, Pierce known me since I was, what, high school? When I was, you know, sitting with the girls. <laughs> OK. So, and of course, we, as I said, we want to accomplish all of this while maintaining the quality of life that we enjoy this Orange County. So, these are our focuses, right? Economic development is the key. So are you guys taking notes? I don't see anybody taking notes. See, I told you, they're smart kids. <laughs> Economic development, focus on workforce, housing, and infrastructure in order to preserve our high quality of life. That is OCBC in one picture by elevator speech. But nobody talks on the elevator, they just look at their phone. Right? So I could just hand this to them and they would know. Alright, so how do we do this? Well, first of all, we are very active in government affairs. That is a big part of our legacy. My predecessor was absolute expert in terms of advocacy, and we continue to carry that on. But as I pointed out earlier, advocacy focused on these objectives. That's where we will be engaged. That's where we will be involved. If it's something that supports economic development, we'll be for it. If it doesn't, we won't be. 
And I mentioned earlier, I mean, all types of people at the table. There may be certain things that are good for economic development that my education partners don't like. Sorry, we're focused on economic development. So having that focus helps from an advocacy perspective. And we're active in DC, in Sacramento, in Santa Ana, and sometimes across the country. The other thing that's key about OCDC is our research. I don't know how many of you utilize our research, but if you're looking for Orange County specific data, we are the place to come. And we are happy to provide that, not only for our investors, but also our partners, such as our chambers. It's extremely important that we have good data, unbiased data, that we can work from it as we're approaching these problems. Some of us come in with preconceived notions or ideas, we got to work from the data. And I'm going to show you some data in a little bit. The other thing is, we have a great communications platform. If you're not on our e-news that comes out every other Monday morning, give me your card. I might be able to get you in for next Monday's edition. Our e-news goes to over 7,000 leaders across Orange County. We use our e-news for three things. Number one, obviously, to promote our initiatives. Number two, to help educate our community, and number three, to promote our investors. And I'll talk about how all of that flows from an economic model in just a second. The other thing is we put on great events. Do we not? Absolutely. See, do I put great events on Paul? Yeah. Uh, Paul's like one of my uh, <coughs> roadies. He's like at all of my events. <laughs> our big annual dinner is coming up on February 15th, Disneyland Hotel. I think we're already over 800 tickets sold. Uh, and that's going to focus, guess what? What do you think I'm going to focus my dinner on? Come on, what are you over there? Housing. Economic development. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to it, we'll get to it. I still love to say this stuff. Okay, but we put on great events. We also have our economic forecast conference. We do a Cal State Fullerton. We do a health care forum. Orange County is the health care capital of the nation, right? We put on a health care forum. Come and learn what's happening in terms of the healthcare sector. Uh, we also have our first responder center. So a lot of fun stuff you can check out that's on our website. So events. So how does this all tie together? All of it supports that focus that I talked about. Economic development while having initiatives around the three risk areas that I've identified. That is OCBC. We are supported by investors and sponsors. We also are supported by strategic partners. Your chamber is one of our strategic partners. Steve and I will communicate frequently. If there's an issue, he feels he needs our support, we're happy to step in. If he needs a speaker to come out, even in the pouring rain at the last minute, here I am, right? But we love working with our strategic partners, and we want to actually do more with our community chambers, our ethnic chambers, because again, we all need to have we all need to be at a table, and we're happy to provide that table. We also have coalition partners throughout the state. So I work with other regional chamber-type organizations. I'm on the board of the LA Regional Chamber, uh, Inland Empire, and even up north, trying to get everybody together. Also, industry groups. We will work with specific industries so we understand their issues, because what we have learned is that the more we are together, the harder it is for them to vote against us. If we're separated, it's very easy to just not pass that bill. Or to just go ahead and pass that bill that we know might hurt these people, but we'll help them, right? We can't serve everybody, so if they're separated, it gives them an easy out. We all need to be together and work together on these issues. And then we do have a back. We do endorse and uh, support candidates uh, at the state county and local level, so you will see us engaged all around the basis of economic development. If you're a politician or a wannabe politician and you want our support, you better be talking about what? Economic development. See? Yeah, we've got the right kids here tonight. Okay, so I'm going to zero in on research now and give you some interesting information about Orange County that some of you may be aware of, and for some of you this may be new. So first let's start off. What is 
the largest county in the nation by population? Los Angeles. Los Angeles. So smart. Did you go to Newport Harbor? Yeah, you don't look like it. <laughs> he looks very sophisticated there. Yeah. 10 million. By far the largest county. Uh, I, I don't want to be the largest county. I'm, I'm going to stop there here. I might get in trouble if I start picking on LA. What's number two?
we are the second highest county in terms of educated population. 43% of our residents, 25 and over, so I gotta go over here. And ignore this side. A couple of you can move over. 43% have a bachelor's degree or higher. That's amazing. By the way, Riverside, San Bernardino County, it's like in the teens. We are where the educated people live. So remember that, guys, when you graduate from college, come home. <laughs> Almost 13% have a graduate or professional degree. We are very educated people. Of course we're smart. We live here. But that means we also tend to have higher income, which means things are a bit more expensive. And our median home price as of May of last year was over a million dollars. 1.26. The average across California is 836, but remember that would include Fresno. So, you know, it all counts. It out. <laughs> but a million three, and it's not going down, even with increased rates. This isn't a real estate presentation, but we could go on on that. But here's the one that really bothers me. When we think about housing and the need for supply of housing, we focus on the affordability index. The affordability index incorporates the most important things that we need to pay attention to. Because it's OK that our home values are high. right? That speaks well for our region. We don't want to decimate the county so that our houses are less than 800,000. The affordability index takes the house, the value of the homes, the income, the average income in the area, and also interest rates and other costs. So this number gets impacted by three variables. How much we make, how costly our housing is, and what the interest rates are. Why did that go blank? I didn't do anything. When it comes to housing, the other statistic that I would be showing you on the screen is that the hourly wage that's needed in order to afford a one-bedroom apartment in Orange County is now $40.63. Wow. I think you guys get the point. Um, we need housing. And the key with housing is it's in the supply. Now, I talked about the affordable inde affordability index and how income is an important part. So, you know, the good news is our median household income in Orange County is now over 100,000. It's 100,559, but that's not everybody. I talked about how we have like three levels of workforce. Everybody needs housing when it comes to supply. And you often hear the term affordable housing. Affordable is a relative term, right? Affordable in Orange County, affordable in Newport Beach, is very different than affordability in other places across the state or across the country. The issue is supply. And there are a couple of things that are impacting our supply. Part of them market-driven and part of them government-driven. The market-driven is the fact that we had a very low period of interest rates for a very long period of time. So if I have a home and my kids have moved out, but I'm sitting on a 2% mortgage. And if I was to move to even downsize, <laughs> that means I have to go out and pick up a mortgage now that's 7%. Right? How inspired am I to sell my house and go move somewhere? Not, Not very. <laughs> right? So naturally, through market forces, we're going to have a lot of people who are going to choose to just stay in their homes. And we're seeing a lot of that, particularly in Orange County. And that's impacting our school districts, where we don't have as many families, therefore they don't have as many, as many students. And so I even see with my charter school, where we have our enrollment is starting to level off, where we thought it would continue to grow at this period of time. So that is a critical aspect of it. All right, so these are the numbers that I was giving you, right, in terms of the household income. But I want to go back to the point on the housing supply. We put so many restrictions on our ability to build housing. In the last three years, 
we have added over $120,000 per door in regulatory costs to build my home. Goodness. 120,000. Folks, for some people, that is the affordability, right? And, you know, minimum wage, you're going to have a hard time at that number. That's just the regulatory cost. Our approach is we need to clear the path. We need to let the builders build. Let the builders determine what the market needs. Clear that path for them. If they get it right, they should make a profit. And if they get it wrong, it's their own capital at risk. But what do we do? We tell them what to build, where to build it, how to build it. And all that does is add more and more to the cost. And if you're a builder and you're looking at places where you're going to deploy your capital, Orange County, even with the high housing demand, is looking less and less attractive. So those are issues that we need to tackle from an advocacy standpoint. And that's just one example where OCBC is at the table bringing people together to try to solve this problem. Because it's a big problem, and I haven't even gotten into homelessness yet. But affordability, there's mental health. But affordability is a big issue. And by the way, I also believe very strongly in equality and the fact that as we grow this economy, we need more of our communities that have not been as engaged to get engaged because we need the workforce. But if there is ever an area where we have seen <coughs> extreme differences in outcomes based on ethnicity, it's in housing. So we have got to have supply. And I think we've said enough about that. The other thing I want to point out, our poverty level has now come up to close to 10 percent. Cal Optima is a barometer that I follow very closely. Cal Optima is about to cross over a million lives covered. If everybody that was eligible was registered, because some people just don't do it, if everybody was registered in Cal Optima, they would be over a million today. That's something we need to think about. But on the other hand, we have an incredible gross regional product. This is the equivalent of GDP. When you hear macroeconomics, they talk about GDP for the country. GNP is our regional. Our GNP here in Orange County is larger than 25 states. We're massive. And we have that power. And we need to get together to exercise that power to be able to continue to grow. That's a big number to work from in terms of economic development. So, Every year we put out our community indicators report. All of this data that I'm showing you is available on my community indicators report, which you can get off my website. Every year we do a special feature in the middle. I call it the centerfold. And this year we focus not just on the housing shortage, because in the past OCBC used to do, they called it a housing scorecard. Think of it as like a report card. Think D's and F's. We all know what that would look like. We wanted to know why. So if you pull up the report, you can go in and we talk very specifically, and I've given you a few examples today of what is limiting our supply of housing. But remember, we talked about that affordability index and how much it's changed. And now I have my data on the board. So you can see, just 11 years ago, we were at 60 affordability. And now we're at 22. And by the way, through here, 19 all the way down, really to 23, was with mortgage rates at their lowest in history. So remember, I talked about the three variables, income, housing price, interest rate. Income was good from 19 to 23. Interest rates were low from 19 to 23. Why did that number go down so much? Housing price. Housing supply. It all comes back to housing supply, and that's why I say that's our number one crisis. So you look at that change in the median home price, that's what's driving it. And I'm not here to propose that we do something to destroy our property values. Absolutely not. What do we need to do to cover the situation? Increase the incomes. Economic development. That's what we come back to. All right. So also, this is an example in terms of, you know, we talked about the density. This is uh, some statistics in terms of the types of housing, persons per household, a lot of great data. 
in our report that I encourage you to go to. And for the sake of time, we're not going to spend a lot more on this. But housing is absolutely the number one issue that we're facing as we go into this year. And it will be for the next few years. And until we get the government out of the way to let our builders build, it's, it's going to continue to be a problem. But maybe we can get it fixed before that side of the room gets back from college. And we have places for you to live. That's my vision and what we're working towards. So housing supply an issue. We do still have continued inflation. There was a Fed meeting yesterday. Uh, you guys know I'm a banker by trade, so I love talking about economics. Some other time I can come back and give an economic forecast. But you know, the fact is, you know, everybody's anticipating, oh, they're going to start dropping rates. Good possibility, because it's an election year. The fact is, we're still seeing too much inflation. And that inflation is a result of massive increase in money supply, which is because of massive government spending. And we still haven't fixed that problem either. Nobody's talking about it. But we continue to run massive deficits, which means we have to print money which increases the money supply, which means you're going to have inflation. And who does that hurt the most? Our lower and middle class. OK. Um, the other issue that we have, I talked about workforce earlier, but folks, we're getting older. Our average age in Orange County continues to go up. Young people are not staying here. They're growing up here. They're going away to college. And they're not coming back. So this is a big issue that we have to think about. Why are so many entities investing in healthcare in Orange County? Why is Orange County the healthcare capital of the nation? Look around here. <laughs> I talked a little bit about politics. I love picking on the politicians, but we really just do it by giving them facts. And the fact is, as I said earlier, we haven't had a pro-business piece of legislation come out of Sacramento in I don't know how long. How long are we going to continue and continue to pick on our businesses? And by the way, when you pick on the big businesses, you're hitting the little guys too. Yeah. I was speaking at an ACCOC event with it was a bunch of newly elected city council people from all of Orange County. And one of them asked me a question. They said, if you were one of us coming into office, what's the number one thing you'd focus on? And I said, pay attention to your small businesses. And make things as easy for them as you can, because the state sure as hell doesn't do that. And the fact of the matter is, like I used the wage example earlier, when you do something to the big guys, it's going to impact the little guys. And we've got to get through that. And we just, it, it, there's no way I can emphasize it anymore. We have a challenging political landscape. There are 120 members of the state legislature, 80 on the assembly, 40 in the Senate. How many of them do you think have ever signed the front of a paycheck? Three. It's pretty close. 12. 12 out of 120. What's the state dealing with right now? Deficit. How many of those 120, how many of them do you think were in office the last time we had a state deficit? Three. Term limits. And it's been that long. Right? So what's our job? Our job is to educate. And I like to pick on it. It's easy to do. It's like picking on a bed chair, right? But the reality is we need to come together with the facts. And we need to recognize that in order to get out of a lot of these issues and challenges we have, we have to continue to grow our economy. And if we want to grow our economy, we need private investment. And in order to get private investment, we have to make business conditions better. And it's at some point, we hit a limit. I would say we're past the limit, but I'm a bit opinionated. All right. The other thing is, I talked about the fact that we had this incredible spending that increased the money supply. Well, that provides a lot of opportunity. And so our focus is, we got to make sure we get our fair share in Orange County. I can guarantee you, as a county, we're paying plenty of money into the federal and state government but we're not getting as much back as we should. And that's another issue. And then regional economic development opportunities. SURF is a state project where they're helping to fund public investment that will inspire 
further private investment. We are the convener for Orange County. They broke the state into 13 regions. Thank God, Orange County, we're our own region. We didn't get lumped in with LA or Inland Empire or San Diego. We're standing on our own. We're the convener. They talked about us getting different interests together at the table. That's really what SURF is all about, and we're about to unveil an economic development program for Orange County that uses a similar concept. We want everybody at the table. We want to hear from different interests. We want to make sure we're working with the facts and going forward with true initiatives that are going to help to spur private investment and allow us to secure as much of the public money that's out there and available as possible. And a lot of other things that we could go in and talk to talk about. But um, anyways, don't give up on the angels yet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but uh, I'm happy to take any questions or okay, any. Yes. So it's been horrible as far as people trying to do any kind of remodel building on the business level, on the private level. What's going on with report teacher? Why does it take so long to have things go through? What, what's so I, I think there's a couple of ways I would respond to it, and I'm not going to respond specifically to Newport Beach. I'm going to pick on Costa Mesa instead. No, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk more broadly in terms of, I think there's a couple of things going on. I think, first of all, we continue to pile on different rules and conditions, primarily from a state level. So honestly, a lot of the control that the cities used to have, they simply don't have anymore because they've got to comply with these different state standards. And I think that has part of it to do. But another part of my career is that I think it's come up a couple of times. I have a charter school, right? And, and our charter school is more and more we have all of these different programs we have to comply with. I am now not only educating our students, I'm also feeding them. I'm providing them after school care. And all of this is like mandated stuff that I have to have administrators for. And cities are facing similar type requirements that come from on high and in many ways limits what they're able to do. Having said all that, we need to have the proper support and the understanding, as I said earlier, what was my advice to the new council members? Focus on your small businesses. Make things as easy as possible. And a lot of that gets into the permitting process and things like that. So that's where we, the people, have to speak up and we have to elect people that are going to recognize and address those things. I'm just wondering, why don't we have a media market as Orange County? Because we're so close to LA and if you go back to that slide, how big was LA? 10 million. LA is the largest media market in the nation. Second is New York. The reason New York wasn't on that is because you have the way they're structured with the boroughs and the counties. It's all broken up. But you, you could easily take LA County and carve it into several counties, right? That would have substantial population. But it's because we're adjacent to LA. Can we secede? Just kidding. Well, <laughs> that's my next question. Right? But I think what, what's interesting to me is that, you know, and, and we've been working this angle. I haven't been in this job long enough to really impact it. But I, I was talking to somebody the other day, I was at a meeting up in LA, and, and, I, and I was talking to somebody from one of the major media, say, one of the TV stations, and I said, you know, if KCAL or KTTV, one of them was to come to Orange County, you talk about an opportunity to differentiate, you guys kind of should come down here, set up your headquarters in Newport Beach or Costa Mesa, right? And have, but, we don't even have our own PBS anymore, right? So it's, it's the fact that we're adjacent to this map. And if you're thinking from the standpoint of how, what funds media, advertising, what drives advertising, markets, we're next to the biggest market there is. So that makes it difficult to differentiate. But I do think one of those could come here, continue to be part of the LA market, but have that differentiation of being Orange County. So we'll see. We'll work on it. I worked in radio years ago. I have no interest in going back. But I think there's an opportunity there. Anybody else? There was a hand over here that I passed on. Did we get it? Yes. I, mean, I, I guess especially on housing, uh, I just, I'm just i hoping that you are supporting electrification because, and, and because we're very close to going over 1.5 
increased Celsius uh, in our temperature, our average temperatures. And that means that sea level rise is coming. And so in 20, 30 years, we may lose a lot of businesses along the sea on yeah. our coast, my, including my house. And, <laughs> and by the way, I, I live on the I ocean. I should be in part, part of, you know, your thinking. I mean, we got to look forward to right. this place. I don't, I don't want to move. I love this place. This is right. the best. This is paradise. So I, but I, it may be gone if we don't take care of it. I hear you. I live in Huntington Harbor. Ah. Okay? I've lived there for over 20 years. I can see that the water is up a bit more. I had to detour to get here today because PCH was flooded. I get it. And I want the same things you want. Yes. However, I don't want to kill our economy to do it. And the fact of the matter is, we can do both. it's going to write, well, I guess my question, anyway, I don't want to, this will be a whole other presentation if we don't right. get too far ahead of ourselves. How do I say this? It's going to happen, right? It's going to happen no matter what. We, we cannot, uh, you know, we can reduce and do everything we can here, and the whole world can do a lot of those different things, but you have cycles that flow through from an environmental standpoint, and we're just one little tick in time of millions of years, and I think it's more important, and where we're focused is not so much from the element in thinking that we can stop it, but more from the standpoint of how can we plan smarter and better in terms of what we're doing with development. And the same issue, you bring up the coastal issue, and I want to take just a moment to talk, there's the other side of this issue, which is fire. And there's this concern that, oh my God, we can't build into these, we can't add new communities. If you go back and look at the statistics, we had a major change in our fire code back in the 90s. Ever since we changed that fire code, what percentage, if you look at all the homes that have been destroyed by wildfire in California, since we changed the fire code, what percentage of the homes that have burned were built after we changed the fire code? Yes. Come on, Peter. 5%. 5%. 10. 10%. How about less than 1%? Yeah. We know how to build planned communities. We know how to build appropriately to protect against wildfire. We need to do similar things when it comes to coastline development and protecting what we have. But my concern is, you know, we, we could cut off all fossil fuel use, and I don't know that it's going to necessarily change. Yes? So we've had an increase of the high rise, particularly on Jamboree and all of that. So when you say build more, build more, build more, what is the vision? Is it for more of those, for living in a little box? Is that where the kids want to go? I don't think so. so Actually, some of them do. Yeah. But this is where I said, let the builders figure that out. The builders know what the market wants. And there's going to be some of that. There's also going to be more single family. There's going to be more master plan communities. Okay. And again, I, don't get me wrong. I am as concerned about the rising sea level as my friend here. I am as concerned about wildfire. I am as concerned about temperature rise, the air we breathe, all of that. But we also have to have a reasonable climate, right? Because these, these are, there's natural forces that we just have to understand we can't control, right? Before I did this, I was running a bank. Running a bank is managing risk. 90% of the risk I was managing, I had no control over. I had no control over interest rates, the economy. I had to manage my bank according to what I saw in terms of this environment and plan appropriately. We have to do the same thing, whether it's mitigation from changing the environment or whether it's how we're going to serve the needs of an increased population. So the short answer to your question is it's a combination. And what is good for Newport is not necessarily good for Costa Mesa or Huntington Beach or anybody else. Each city has to figure it out for themselves. But I think the city that is allowing for population growth is going to improve the retail environment, which will then help them from a fiscal standpoint. But in terms of what we build and how we build it and where we build it, the builders will figure that out. And then the market will decide. And there actually is very high demand in the younger ages for that higher density. They like to. Look at them, they're all sitting together, so yeah. <laughs> right? But, 
<laughs> but they have, but it's, and that's why I say the issue is supply. And we need some of everything in order to be able to address that. We still have a lot of properties that are not fully utilized. We've got excess office buildings that could be converted to residential. It's very expensive. Some of the more modern office buildings, it's not an easy conversion. It may involve a teardown. But if you wanted to buy an office property in Orange County and convert it into housing, oh my god, you're talking about a four to five year planning period that you're going to be invested in. That's expensive, especially with interest rates where they are. So now you want to talk about affordability. If it takes me four or five years to do something like that, with every city, we can go in and look where there's areas that we have opportunity that we can develop. Not every neighborhood needs a high rise, but remember, we're already pretty high density to begin with. And we don't have a lot of land to work with because we want to continue to preserve some of these open spaces. So we can all enjoy it. That's part of what makes Orange County so special. So we gotta make the most use of the land that we have. I know I went over, but I hope you guys appreciate it. No, I'm not stopping because one of my students. Okay. <laughs> I've been waiting for a question over here. Yeah. Hi. Um, you're, I hear that you're saying that Newport Beach is such a small piece of the puzzle in terms of like protecting the environment. But if every city thinks that, how are you going to get We can't assume that we're insignificant. What I'm saying is we have to think in terms of reasonableness with what it is and how we're trying to get there, right? We have this this audacious goal as a state to get to total electrification by, what is it, 20, 35? That's 12 years, people. And we have no plan to get there. So how are we going to do? And, you know, you can't take if, if um, you can't electrify all the fire trucks with the technology we have today. Right? You might be able to use hydrogen, but do you really want a hydrogen tank fire truck going into a fire zone? <laughs> right? So we have to, we tend to, it's always good to have these goals, but you got to have a plan. And just like for you, as you come out of high school and, you know, wherever you, whatever career path you choose to go, you need to have a goal, something you want to do, but you also got to have a plan to get there. You can't just say, I'm going to be a medical doctor. Okay. What are your grades? What classes are you taking? How many AP courses are you taking right now? What college do you think you can get into? How are you going to fund that? Right? What courses are you going to focus on? But you have to have a plan now to get to where you want to be. It's the same thing in dealing with these issues. We want to get to this. We all agree we want to have clean air. We want to do what we can to protect our shoreline and all of our environment. I am right with you. But I don't want to go to such an extreme that we impact our quality of life. I just, I guess I just don't see the plan forming. Like, I don't see what the plan I don't is. either. I don't either. And that is a fault of our generation. Okay. And it's probably going to get passed to you in terms of, we have to have, it's great to have these plans. Well, these are our future leaders, right? We are leaving them with all of these challenges and no plan. They keep telling us that. Right? And so, what can we do to have a plan? And I can try to impact what happens in Orange County. I can't impact what happens in New Delhi. I can't impact what happens in Beijing. But everybody has to be doing it, and you're not, it's just not the way the world works, right? So we need to do what we can from a planning standpoint to be able to protect our region and to do the right things, make the right decisions that fully account for all of this risk that's happening. But to think that we don't need to protect our shoreline because we think we can go to full electric by 2035 and therefore the sea level's not gonna rise, no. We have to assume it's gonna happen, right? So let's focus on what we can do to protect and continue to grow. And the good news is we have the technology and that technology is improving every year. And that's where I think we're going to have the opportunities. And Orange County is at the forefront of a lot of these ideas and things that are going to approach the issues that you're going to have to face. Hello, round of applause. Sorry for the little technological snafu there, but um, Francine uh, saved us, saved the day. Thank you, Francine, wherever you are. Uh, normally, I'll go through a few closing remarks, but we are way over, so if you're interested in joining us for any of our upcoming program, go to newportbeach.com. All of our events are listed there. We've got a, a bunch
bunch of things happening this month. Thank you all for coming. Glad to see the deck of kids here today, or young men and women, I should say, not kids. And uh, tell your friends in DECA to, to join us. We'd love to have them for our uh, first Thursday of the month uh, coming up. So keep dry, and we'll see you uh, next time. <laughs>